Tonight we're going to have, we have with us Robert Whittaker. Um, Robert uh, is a journalist and the author of four books. Much of his writing is focused on psychiatry, um, the pharmaceutical industry, and medical histories. His first book, Man in America, which we were just talking about, Bad Science, Bad Medicine, and Enduring His Treatment of the Mentally Ill, was named by Discover Magazine as one of the best science books of 2002. Um, his second book, The Mapmaker's Wife, True Tale of Love, Murder, and Survival in the Amazon, was named the American Library Association, by the American Library Association, as one of the best biographies of 2004. Uh, in 2008, Crown published his book, on the laps of gods, the red summer of 1919, and the struggle for justice that remade a nation, which was awarded the Anthony J. Lucas Work in Progress Prize. Um, his newest book, Anatomy of an Epidemic, Magic Bullets, Psychiatric Drugs, and the Astonishing Rise of Mental Illness in America, won the Investigative Reporters and Editors Book Award for Best Investigative Journalism in 2010. Uh, prior to writing these books, uh, Robert worked on worked as a science and medical reporter at the Albany Times Union newspaper in New York uh, for quite a while. His journalism articles won several national awards, including a George Polk Award for medical writing and a National Science a National Association of Science Writers Award for best magazine article. A series he co-wrote for the Boston Globe was named as a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize in 1998. So we were very fortunate to have. Uh, Mr. Whitaker. Thanks very much. It's, it's really nice to be here. Um, this, I, I wrote Madden America in 2002, which is in that book where I wrote about the history of eugenics. So this is the first time I've been talking about this surgery for almost 10 years. So we'll see how much I can remember now. I have my cheat, cheat note, my, my crib notes here. Um, I think the big picture is this that we'll talk about. I'll talk about 45 minutes and we'll have some time for just discussion. We, we, in the United States, of course, we have this big picture history that sort of governs our society, which is sort of this history of the chosen people. And we go back to the Declaration of Independence that all men are created equal. And we have this sense that uh, society was born with these sort of really profound principles of democracy, et cetera. And, and then we do have the sense that we are the a people better than other people, so to speak, in our history. The eugenics history tells a different story. It's one of our darkest episodes in American history. It isn't really taught in American schools, but I think it should be taught. It's an important part of our history. It talks about how complicated our history has been. And I'll, and I'll talk about how that affected care of, quote, mental people with psychiatric problems for the first half of the 20th century. And then we'll talk about whether these sort of eugenic attitudes towards the, quote, mentally ill have really disappeared. Are they still around? just hidden, that sort of thing. So that's sort of the context for this whole story. So if we go back to where eugenics arose, how this began to infect our society, it of course comes from Charles Darwin as the beginning moment. So in, Charles, in 1859, Charles Darwin publishes Origin of the Species. And of course, what is the story? What are the three points, really, that you get from Origin of the Species? One is that species evolve. Two, that uh, evolution is driven through a struggle for the survival of the fittest, and the fit therefore pass on their genes. And three, in nature, the unfit are not allowed to, they don't get a chance to procreate. Okay, those are sort of the three principles you see in uh, Origin of Species. Now, Charles Darwin doesn't talk about humans, he's really talking about others, but obviously the implication is that the human species evolved and could evolve in the future. It's not a static place, so to speak or static uh, species. So Charles Darwin's cousin, named uh, Sir Francis Galton, he sees this, and he's going to become the father of the eugenics movement, or, uh, idea as a science. Who is Sir Francis Galton? He was born in 1822 to a rich family in Birmingham, England. When, he was eight, when in 1844 his father died, he therefore inherited a lot of money and never had to work for a living. Anyway, his cousin's book comes out, and he immediately grasps this idea. He says, if species evolve, and, and already we have uh, farmers selectively breeding their, 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 their livestock, right, to improve their pigs and cows and also their plants, etc. So if, if 
farmers can do that with their livestock and can do it with their plants, why can't societies do it with humans is the idea. And so the minute you have this idea, you're going to start to think about who needs to breed and who does not need to breed, so to speak. So what does he say? Could not the race of men be similarly improved? Could not the undesirables be got rid of and the desirables multiplied? So that's his first principle. You hear that? Principle is, there's a, we're going to start separating society into the desirables. We're going to help them breed. And we're going to have this other group, the undesirables. And we're not going to have them breed. That's the core principle we're going to see play out. But it starts right away with Sir Francis Galton as a key principle of eugenics. So the next thing what he does is he, in 1869, he publishes a scientific work called Hereditary Genius. And what he does is he goes around and he looks at a thousand, I think it's a thousand people, yes, prominent English leaders, bankers, scientists, um, writers, etc. And he finds that those thousand people come from a, a select group of people in England, sort of the upper class. And he says, look at these, and he says, look at, it's just a small group of people that are, are, have such accomplishments in our society. Now, and many are closely related. Now, obviously, why is this? Well, he's a perfect example. He doesn't have to work for a living, right? He has a chance to, you know, explore science, etc. Obviously, what he's really seeing is how class-bound uh, the society is, but he doesn't see it that way. He says, these people have better germplasm. Mm -hmm. That's why they, they, in, that they succeed so much, and the rest of people, they don't succeed because they're, in essence, inferior. And so what does he conclude? He says, this means that he's, he's talking about how humans, if we really look at it, are decidedly unequal. Democratic ideals that men are of, quote, equal, equal value are simply, quote, undeniably wrong and cannot last. Even the ordinary citizen, quote, is too base for the everyday work of modern civilization. So, given this thought, he immediately says, what do we as a society have to do? We have to encourage those with good germplasm to breed and those with bad germplasm not to breed. And here's what he writes. I do not see why any insolence of caste should prevent the gifted class, when they have the power, from treating their compatriots with all kindness so long as they maintain celibacy. He's talking about the poor, etc. But if these compatriots continue to procreate children inferior in moral, intellectual, and physical qualities, it is easy to believe that the time may come when such persons would be considered as enemies to the state and to have forfeited all claims to kindness. So this is, you can see right away, we're going to distinguish between the fit and the unfit, and those who we're going to, we're going to call the unfit could be considered, A, we don't want them breeding, and two, if they do breed, enemies of the state. So this is a founding principle. And then in 1883, he coins the term eugenics, as the, and it's derived from the, the Greek word, which means well-born, as the science, he says, that would, quote, improve the human stock by giving, quote, the more suitable races or strains of blood a better chance of prevailing speedily over the less suitable than they otherwise would have had. And what he's saying is here, society has to support the rich and the, to, in this Darwinian struggle for survival, we've got to give them extra advantages and help them breed. And those who are, quote, cacogenic or badly born, we have to suppress their breeding impulses. <coughs> and this is the founding moment of the eugenics movement in 1883. Now, he's English, but where eugenics will first be, get a root in, in academic communities and will first have social policies enacted, it's in the United States, not in England. And why does it find such fertile soil here? Well, in the 1880s, 1890s, when these ideas are being promoted, the U.S. is changing a lot. It really, if you look at the population early on, it's a very white Anglo-Saxon Protestant group, but going in the late 1700s, of course, we have slaves, and we have a black population, but it's a very waspy population initially. And they're, of course, at the top of the heap. By the 18, starting in the 1850s and on, we get a lot of immigration. We get Jews, we get Italians, we get Irish, we get Slavs, etc. And all of a sudden, the country's becoming more Catholic, uh, you know, and not just Protestant, and not just, quote, old English white. So that ruling class here 
feels threatened by the immigration is basically it. We also have, of course, in the 1880s, the freedmen. So that we, of course, we're at the, in the Civil War, we've got four and a half million blacks that have been freed. So the country seems to be changing rapidly. So it is picked up, and in the, the first sort of eugenic tract you see published in the United States is published in 1891 by a feminist, an American feminist named Virginia Woodhull. She publishes a book called The Rapid Multiplication of the Unfit. She writes, the best minds of the day agree that, quote, imbeciles, criminals, paupers, and the otherwise unfit must not be bred. For that to occur, she notes, the unfit have to be prohibited from marrying, segregated into asylums, and forcibly sterilized. So as early as 1891, she's setting out a social agenda for sort of preventing the unfit from breeding. Now what will then happen is eugenics will begin to take hold and be accepted as a legitimate science uh, there's a, over the next 20, 30 years. And, and, and we'll see how it happens that it becomes accepted as a science. The first step, and by the way, the funding for the development of this science comes from the industrial titans of America at the time. It comes <coughs> from Andrew Carnegie. It comes from John D. Rockefeller Jr. And in particular, it also comes from a Mary Harriman, who's the widow of a railroad magnate, Edward Harriman. So the founding moment is 1904. Um, Andrew Carnegie provides funds to a man named Charles Davenport to establish in, in Cold Spring Harbor, uh, Long Island, quote, it, the name of the group is going to be the Center for the Study of Human Evolution. And again, it's to be a eugenics center. Now, who is, who is Charles Davenport? He um, is of WASP heritage. He's Harvard educated. Now, remember, it's, it's 1904, and he would like to boast that his people have been in America for 300 years. I'm not sure how they've been here for 300 years, but that's what he would boast. So what is the first thing that Charles Davenport begins to say? Well, he begins to say that human traits are passed down in the same way uh, that eye color is. So we get in the 18, I forget exactly when, Gregor Mendel, the Austrian monk who says that certain characteristics come in gene pairs, let's say, uh, let's say with his pea plants. So you have a gene, let's say, for a tall pea plant, a gene for a short pea plant, if the a tall gene is the um, dominant gene and you have a, a tall and short gene, the, the plant is tall. If you have two short genes, then the plant is short. Okay, that's these old Mendelian uh, genetics. And he says human behaviors, he makes the claim, are um, handed down in the same way, in these sort of simple gene pairs. So he says, for example, you have gene pairs for nomadism, uh, shiftlessness, insincer insincerity, and again, these are gene pairs. And immigrants from Southern European, he says, inherited genes that made them, quote, more given to crimes of larceny, kidnapping, assault, murder, rape, and sex immorality. Jews inherited genes for thieving and prostitution. So again, basically, you would see these different immigrant groups said to have certain behavioral characteristics, and it's genetic in kind. But what are we starting to do here? We're also starting to rank people by fit and unfit. And so who's going to be at the bottom of this list? Well, it's going to be blacks, it's going to be the freedmen, and at the very bottom is going to be the insane. But that's what we're going to start doing. We're going to start um, ranking people in this way. Now, going forward, in 1910, at Cold Harbor, they established the Eugenics Record Office. The purpose of the Eugenics Record Office was to go out into American society and start in the manner of a census. Uh, figuring out who are the, quote, cacogenic, the unfit in American society. So they trained, I think it was 258 um, uh, field workers who then went out into prisons. They went out into asylums. And they just went out into communities and tried to figure out what percent of the population have genes unfit to be passed on. And this effort was again funded by Mary Harriman. And in, uh, I think it was in four years, yes, they had made a conclusion and they set out their sterilization agenda. They concluded, and the, the group that concluded this, that was part of the um, Cold Spring Harbor group, the Eugenics Record Office, the, the group was named the Committee to Study and to Report on the Best Practical Means of Cutting Off the Defective Germplasm in the American Population. And they concluded that 10% of the American population needed to be sterilized. This is in 1914. Now, just to give you an idea, we, we tend to think that eugenics wasn't popular with the American people. 
it, as we go forward, we're going to see the majority of Americans believed in eugenic policies. But here's what Teddy Roosevelt, the great populist, said in response to this report that 10% of Americans needed to be sterilized. He says, and this is what he writes to the committee that put forth this. He says, at, at present, there is no check to the fecundity of those who are subnormal. So he's embracing this idea that 10% need to be um, uh, sterilized. Now, going forward, um, what happens? By 1914, when this report is issued, there are 44 colleges in America that are now teaching eugenics in their curriculums. As in the same way they might teach physics, they might teach mathematics, they'll teach eugenics in their science department. These, these classes are particularly pronounced at the Ivy Leagues, Harvard, Cornell, Brown, etc. Why? Because they're bastions, of course, of wasp privilege at this time. So they're, they're really, this is, it's going to be an Ivy League nurtured science. MIT does it as well. They also begin to have the, the American um, Genetics Association starts a journal called the Journal of Heredity. And now these scholars begin publishing research articles on this. They talk about um, the birth rates of the unfit and how they have high birth rates. You'll see articles lamenting how wasps are not procreating nearly as fast as the unfit. And there's even articles about how the daughters of, uh, you know, the pilgrims aren't, or the American Revolution are particularly bad at procreating. Um, and you'll see things like this. Here's an article that le uh, likens immigrants to a bacterial invasion. There's another article tied The Menace of the Half Man, in which the writer concludes that if the country could get rid of its defectives, then, quote, human misery in a well-ordered country like America will be more than cut in half. Mm. And just to, by 1924, more than 9,000 papers on eugenics had been published in academic journals, 9,000 papers. Mm. So again, there's a lot of people researching and writing on this. Finally, also, the Eugenics Research Association, they had their own research association, they boasted in 1924 that 119 of 383 members were fellows of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, which is the nation's most presti prestigious scientific group. Point is, these are mainstream scientists in many ways that are pushing this agenda. So, we get a seed planted in the 1880s, right? We see Virginia Woodhull talk about this. Then we see funding by the industrial titans for the um, eugenics record office at Cold Spring Harbor. Then we see it taken up as science. So what happens in the 1920s? We now have to sell the eugenics to the population as a whole. This is the next step. Now this begins really with, the, in 1921 I think is the founding moment of really selling it to the, the population. And at that, home, at that time in New York City at the American Museum of Natural History, uh, there's the Second International Congress on Eugenics, and this meeting is funded in part by the Carnegie Institution and the Rockefeller Foundation. Here's how the conference was kicked off by the museum president, Henry Fairfield Osborne. He says, it is time for science, quote, to enlighten government in the preventing of the spread and multiplication of worthless members of our society. So that's the comment that is at the American Museum, uh, the Natural Museum of History. Now, there were, this conference lasted for three days. People from MIT, Harvard, Johns Hopkins, Princeton, Cornell, etc., gave presentations of their uh, papers. And again, it was about the rapid multiplication of the unfit and the lack of multiplication of the very fit. And here's some of the talks. They gave talks on the Jewish problem, quote, the dangers of Negro-white intermixture, and so forth. <coughs> Now this sounds extreme, right? It sounds crazy. Do you know what happened to the exhibits at that conference where they were then sent for the next three months? To the American capital. So they were went to the American capital and were on display there for three months. My point of this is, if they go to the American capital, this is not seen as crazy stuff, right? This is seen as mainstream science. Now after that meeting, here's what the New York Times editorial, editorialized after this, second, after this meeting at the, the Natural Museum of History. They write this. Civilization, as now organized, does not leave nature as fresh as she has been in the past to procure the survival of the fits. Modern philanthropy, working hand in hand with modern medical science, 
is preserving many strains which in all preceding ages would have been inexorably eliminated, strains of human beings. While life has become easier in the lower ranges, it has become more difficult for the well-born and the educated who pay for modern philanthropy and an ever-lessening ability to afford children of their own. This is why they're not procreating. They say taking so much time uh, caring for the unfit. <clears throat> there is a very serious question whether the 20th century will be able to maintain and pass onward the infinitely intricate and specialized structure of civilization created by the 19th century. Again, this is a New York Times editorial saying that this has merit. Now, in the wake of that conference, um, the organizers of that conference, Charles Davenport and other mainstream eugenicists said, we need to form a national eugenic society, an American eugenic society. And so they now said this was on our drawing board. And as a first step, they said, we're going to recruit 99 famous or well-known sci scientists to be an advisory council. And they send out a letter to the best scientists of the country. And in this letter, you can see, they warn of, quote, racial deterioration and the need to, quote, com to resist the, quote, complete destruction of the white race. This is how they're recruiting scientists. And they said, if we adopt eugenics policies, quote, our burden of taxes can be reduced by decreasing the number of degenerates, delinquents, and defectives supported in public institutions. So they recruit an advisory council. And who is this advisory council? They are an elite group. From 1923 to 1935, more than half were graduates of Ivy League universities. Nine college presidents served on the council. They also had people serving on the council who were from leaders of the American Psychological Association, the American Psychiatric Association, the American Neurological Association, and the American Association for the Advancement of, scientists, of Science. So again, it's mainstream scientists. Now finally in 1926, five years after that conference, the American Eugenic Society is officially formed. It's funded in part by John D. Rockefeller and George Eastman of Eastman Kodak fan, fame. It grows into a national organization with <coughs> chapters in 28 states. What is the purpose of the American Eugenic Society? It is now to educate the public, to put out education materials about how eugenics is a science and basically how we have to have the the fit breed and the unfit not breed. And remember, at the core of this is a sterilization strategy, that we're going to sterilize the unfit and keep them from breeding. So what did they do? One of the things they did is they, they uh, developed traveling exhibits. And by the way, I have some of the, I didn't have um, slides here. If you want to see some of the pictures of this, you can go to a, a website that I have, robertwhitaker.org, and you just click on the book uh, Mad in America, and you'll see some of these a eugenic exhibits on there, some slides, etc. So one of the exhibits they went to, you know, schools and county fairs was called "Some People Are Born to Be a Burden on the Rest," and what it had was a, was a thing with lights that flashed, and like every 15 seconds a light would flash, and that meant that society was spending so much money on the unfit, and then every 30 seconds a light would flash, and it said another degenerate has now been born. <laughs> Um, I think the actual word is uh, defective, excuse me. And then finally, there was one light over here that hardly ever blinked. After seven and a half minutes, it would finally blink. And that was a sign that somewhere in the United States, a high-grade person had finally been born. <laughs> so this went uh, you know, to exhibits, etc. Another exhibit that they would have as part of their traveling exhibits was to explain that uh, certain characteristics were inherited in the same way as eye color was, or you know, plant size, etc. So they would have these things, you know, showing eye color. If you had like blue, like blue and brown, and brown is the dominant, and you know, the whole thing about if, if you get one gene for blue, one for brown, you're brown-eyed, and you need two for blue. Well, basically, they had a thing saying the same thing about. Um, all sorts of human characteristics. And we'll talk about mental illness, but basically one of the things they had is you could either have an insane gene or a normal gene. If you had a both, you were normal, but you were a carrier. But if you got two insane genes, then you were insane. So it was a simple, simple Mendelian uh, gene thing that was handed down. By the way, well, this is a bit of a side. At these, if you could go back to the fairs at this time, so these things would come and they would have this traveling exhibit about how some people are born to be a burden on the rest. They would also have fitter family contests. 
So you know how in, in, in county fairs they will have the best pig and the best cow, and et cetera, and you compete to have the best pumpkin? Well, families would also bring their family histories and compete in the family fairs to be named the fittest family. And at the end of the fair, they would actually have parades sometimes where they would have the fittest stock and they'd have the pigs and the cows and then the fittest family would be riding in a car. <laughs> and there are pictures of that and the cars would often call this the state's best crop of the family that was the fittest family. Uh, what else did the American Eugenics Society did? They tried to recruit the clergy to give a uh, uh, eugenics message and they would award uh, ministers and all who gave the best eugenic sermon cash prizes for giving this message that we are not born equal. And here's, for example, in 1928, the winner was a, name, a, a Reverend William Mason, and he won the top prize that year by telling his congregation, quote, that modern science had proven that all men are created unequal. And he says, trying to lift the un Lift up the unfit with education and social programs is, quote, like attempting to grow better alfalfa with dandelion seed. Can't do it. He explained, we may raise a pig in the parlor, but he remains a pig. And this won the, uh, the best sermon of the year. They also put out a pamphlet called um, Tomorrow's Children. It was 137 pages. This urged Americans to think of uh, the American Eugenic Society as, quote, a society for the control of social cancer, with sterilization the way to do so. The pamphlet said, crime and dependency keep on increasing because new defectives are born, just as new cancer cells remorsely, remorselessly penetrate into sound tissue. So you can see what happened over this time. We get Darwin, then we get Sir Francis Galton with saying that there's this new science out there, eugenics, that's gonna help human societies evolve. Very simple idea, you gotta have the quote, fit breed and the unfit not breed. You can see how contrary that is to basically what we believe are American principles, all men are created equal. We then get it uh, sort of nurtured by rich people in this country as a science. And then by the 20s and 30s, there's this effort to convince the American population this is a good science. And so that's what goes on. So now let's see what I'll do is I'll talk about how these eugenic ideas affected the mentally, quote, you know, those diagnosed as mentally ill, and a little bit as how it affected, uh, you know, uh, African Americans, blacks as well. Okay? And then we'll go forward from there. So. We talked about Mendelian characteristics. Davenport in 1904, when he goes there to the Cold Spring Harbor and has the Society for the Study of Evolution, etc., he commissions a man named Aaron Rosenhoff, who's at King's Hospital, I think, here in Brooklyn, in New Yorkers, etc., to do a study of the insane. And it's Aaron Rosenhoff that indeed finally concludes that there's an insane gene and a normal gene. And the way he does this is this science. He looks at 72 hospitalized patients, and he looks at the offspring of 1,097 relatives of these 72 hospitalized patients. Now initially he finds that only about, I think it's like, uh, it's just a small number seem to be insane, and it doesn't, doesn't fit his story about a simple Mendelian gene. So what does he do? He goes, and re <laughs> he goes and looks at these relatives and he starts saying, well, you're a little bit agitated. You count as mentally ill. And he just expands the boundaries. You've been sad. You're mentally ill. Until he gets a number of the 1,097, he concludes that 351 are mentally ill. It's a right on the number if you believe in Mendelian uh, genetics. So he comes out. He says this. Now, this gets published in textbooks that this is the latest science that has been found. Even though there were some people who said, this is the most ludicrous thing we've ever heard in our life. But here, here's the key thing. See how specific this does when you have Mendelian things? You're either normal or you're abnormal. We're going to say that there's this decide dividing line between people. It's not that you can have some psychiatric distress. It's who you are. Okay, you see that? And the New York Times, editorialized partly as a result of this understanding, it is certain that the marriage of two mental defectives ought to be prohibited because if they're carriers of a single gene, they will pass on that defective gene. 
All right, now how about social policy towards, what's that? That was in 1923. At this time, uh, that, you know, this whole idea of enacting social policy. So what are the social policies that were enacted towards the mentally ill? Well, the first thing is they're going to prevent the, quote, the insane from marrying. They're going to establish laws. Now, the first uh, state to establish such a law was Connecticut in 1896, five years after Virginia Woodhull did that. And by, by 1933, there was no state left in the country where the insane could legally marry. So how did this work? You went to your clerk, asked for your marriage license, and there was a little thing you had to say, are you insane? If you said you were insane, you weren't allowed to marry. But what the eugenicists noticed is very few people checked on the I am insane box. <laughs> <laughs> As the eugenicists complained, they are biased in favor of themselves. <laughs> so, what did they have to do? The marriage laws weren't working. They had to segregate the, uh, quote, mad, the insane, in asylums. So now, if we think of mental hospitals, the old asylums. Now, if you go back to the original meaning of the word asylum, it's actually a nice meaning. It's like a refuge from sort of the difficulties of life. It's an asylum for that. You go there, you, you, you get nurtured back to health, etc., and then you, you come back. But now what we're going to do is the idea is we will lock up the defectives and we will keep them there through their breeding years. And so, for example, you can say, hear this comment from eugenicists in 1914. It is coming, I think, to be generally conceded that permanent segregation, at least during the period of reproductive capacity, is the preferred solution. Okay, we're going to put them away and we're going to prevent them from breeding. Now you can see that it is during this eugenics era that we get the arise of the population in state mental hospitals. In 1880, there were 37, 31,000 people in the United States in state and county mental hospitals, basically state mental hospitals. And if you look at that number, many of them in fact are people that we would say have Alzheimer's today. Okay, it's, in, it's basically they're serving as nursing homes often. It's in-stage dementia, and it's also related to syphilis. Syphilis, if you, untreated syphilis, which was unsyphilis this time, it ends up in dementia, lots of bizarre things. So a lot of people here are there ill with neurological disorders. 31,000. But now we're going to say we're going to lock up the mentally ill. And by 1940, 60 years later, we had 419,000 patients in state hospitals. So we went from 31,000 to 419. You can also look at what was happening to first episode patients. Prior to 1880, those that were just coming in for first episode of psychosis, they generally got released. They were there for 12 months, 18 months. Now once we get the eugenics era, they just aren't released anymore. You start being people going in at younger ages and they just stay there. And you can see also, there's a great book called The Lives They Left Behind. Have any of you heard this book? It's, what it, it's a book in which they went, a state hospital was closed, and people left behind um, basically <coughs> suitcases that were filled with their notes, their, their personal items, etc. So researchers went into those suitcases and they put back together a picture of the lives of people who were getting hospitalized in 1910, 1920, 1930, etc. And I'm telling you, it was, it was immigrants acting differently, that sort of thing. You didn't have to be too crazy to be locked up in a hospital and just kept there. So anyway, that's what they've done there. So, and because of this, by the end of 1920s, you'll see in the Journal of Heredity, eugenicists saying this, segregation of the insane is now fairly complete. So you saw it as a social policy. But now what's the a more permanent solution? It's sterilization, right? If we sterilize them, then they can't pass on their bad genes. In 1914, remember, we need to sterilize 10% of the American population. That's the idea. Well, the first state to pass a compulsory uh, a sterilization law was Indiana in 1907. And over the next 20 years, 30 state legislatures passed such laws. Now, initially, however, states were a lot of the laws were vetoed by governors, and there was a lot of opposition to these forced sterilization laws. Who did the opposition come from? Catholics, Jews, anyone who wasn't a wasp, basically, right? So this made it really the society was quite uneasy about this, and there really weren't many sterilizations done. 
initially except in California. For whatever reason, it did start to happen more there. Then in 1920, so the big question is, is this constitutional? Does the state have a right to forcibly sterilize people? And it comes up before the US Supreme Court in 1927 in a case called Buck versus Bell. And by an eight to one vote, the United States Supreme Court says it is constitutional. States have the right to forcibly sterilize people. Here's what they wrote. We have seen more than once that the public welfare may call upon the best citizens for their lives. It would be strange if it, if, if it could not call upon those who already sapped the strength of the state for these lesser sacrifices, often not felt to be such by those concerned in order to prevent being swamped with incompetence. It is better for all the world if instead of waiting to execute degenerate offspring for crime or to let them starve for their imbecility, society can prevent those who are manifestly unfit from continuing their kind. So that's what the US Supreme Court ruled by 8 to 1 in 1927. And after this, uh, forced sterilizations in the United States do take off. And by in the 1930s, we're sterilizing about 2,200 people per year, adults in this country. By the end of World War II, 45,000 people had been sterilized, and about half of those came were people in the state hospitals, okay, they were confined populations. Now, sterilization does not completely end in 1945, but it tapers off, and of course, the reason it tapers off is the horrors of Nazi Germany come out, and that's clearly a eugenics policy. What would be the final solution? Kill them, right? If we just killed the unfit. Now, generally, there wasn't much discussion of this, but it was talked about in certain corners. As early as 1911, <coughs> Charles Davenport, remember, he's the Harvard-educated person who was the first given funds to establish the eugenics office in Cold Spring Harbor. He wrote this in a book. He says that if a society has to choose between allowing the unfit to procreate or killing them, the latter is the preferable option. So here at this scientific thing, they're saying this is a possibility. In 1916, Madison Grant, who was a wealthy New York attorney and one of the founders eventually of the American Eugenics Society, wrote a book called The Passing of the Great Race, and he says this, the laws of nature require the obliteration of the unfit, and human life is valuable, valuable only when it is of use to the community or race. So he's setting up the possibility that maybe we need to kill people. 1916, excuse me. Now here I found something in the New York Times to, sh to say that this idea was not totally beyond the pale. So in 1921, Connecticut legislators began debating a law for euthanasia of the mentally ill, the hopelessly mentally ill. And they had the legislators uh, tour an insane asylum and they were given a tour of one person who was manacled to the wall and the New York Times reported on it in this way. Uh, oh, here's, here was the purpose of the, here's what the law was do. Here's what the New York said. Connecticut legislators are, are contemplating passing a law, quote, that would provide that persons found to be hopelessly insane after observation and examination of experts should be put to death as mercifully as possible, perhaps by poison. You can read the headline. They talk about the legislators going, seeing this man who's presented them, and the headline is exhibited as case for merciful extinction. All I'm saying is, this is in a paper, as if this is something to be discussed. Now, after this, remember what's happening at this time, okay? This is the time that the American Eugenics Society is trying to educate people, that certain people are social cancers, etc. And now we get discussion of human beings in, with language over the next 15 years by eugenicists that is just astonishing. Here's how you'll see the unfit referred to in various eugenic publications. You can hear them described as social wastage, malignant biological growths, poisonous slime. Those are some of the terms given. Then in the 1930s, Harvard's Ernest Houghton, I think he's a professor of anthropology, writes, the unfit quote, are specimens of humanity who really ought to be exterminated, <coughs> says a Harvard professor. Finally, in 1935, Alexis Carroll, he's a Nobel Prize winning physician at Rockefeller Institute for Medical Research on the east side here. 
He writes a book that is reviewed by the New York Times and other mainstream publications called Man the Unknown. And he writes this. Gigantic sums are now required to maintain prisons and insane asylums and protect the public against gangsters and lunatics. Why do we preserve these useless and harmful beings? The abnormal prevent the development of the normal. This fact must be squarely faced. Why should society not dispose of the criminals and insane in a more economical manner? He goes on and he says, at least any insane person who commits a crime, he concludes, should be humanely and economically disposed of in small euthanasic institutions supplied with proper gases. So that's in 1935. Now we know where this is going to happen, but now let's go back. In 1925, Adolf Hitler writes his book, Mein Kampf, right? And he basically says eugenics is the public health approach that will restore Germany to its greatness. And you know what is happening here. We have World War I, Germany loses a lot of men, and it's also sort of impoverished. Germany wants to rebuild, and Adolf Hitler is saying in Mein Kampf, it's eugenics that will bring us back to a strong nation. Now the very year he writes that tract, um, Americans, most notably the Rocker Foundation, give money to Germany to found a eugenics institute in Munich. This very same year it's written. So they give 2.5 million to establish the Psychiatric Institute in Munich, which becomes Germany's leading center for eugenic research. So. German eugenics policies will be funded by us. I'm sorry, you said the Rockefeller Foundation? Yes. So they gave them money to, to found this institute that will pursue eugenic policies in Nazi Germany. In Germany. I'm sorry, what year was that? That's 1925 it gets established. Okay. Now Hitler comes to power in 1933, and one of the first things they want to do, Hitler, since he has a eugenics in agenda, is to start sterilizing the mentally ill. Okay, and they want to pass a law. So what they do is they come to the United States, since we've been doing it, they send their scientists, and particularly they go to California to look at how we sterilize people here. You know, they're, they're going to learn from us. And so, in fact, they do so. They go back, and actually Germany, when it sets up its sterilization program, believe that they're doing it in a very, a much more, what's, what's the word for it? Careful way, legal way. They set up a due process, process mechanism the mentally ill will be hauled off to heredity courts, they will be deemed defective, and they'll be sterilized. The point is it's a legal process. It's not just an ad hoc process. Now when they pass this comprehensive sterilization bill, here's what American eugenicists say. They note with pride, this law was formulated only after careful study of the California experiments. Also when Nazi Germany passes its comprehensive um, sterilization bill, it is applauded by the New England Journal of Medicine, the American Public Health Association, and the New York Times. The New York Times, talking about Germany's uh, new law, yeah, cites it as an example of a progressive modern public health system. Here's what the New York Times writes. Germany is, quote, just following the path of, quote, other civilized nations, most notably the United States, where, quote, some 15,000 unfortunates have been harmlessly and humanely operated upon to prevent them from propagating their own kind. That's New York Times responding to Germany passing its sterilization law. Now once Germany does this, they get, they get ahead of the United States. They start sterilizing quite a few. Over the next six years, they sterilize 375,000 people. And as this happens, you will see some American eugenicists com complaining that Germany is now beating us at our own game, that's a quote, and thereby making herself a stronger nation. <coughs> so they sterilized 375,000 people, and then in January of 1940, they began, Germany I'm talking about, uh, killing the mentally ill. And this actually is the precursor, of course, to the Holocaust and the, and the killing of, of, of Jews, etc. So why do they start killing the mentally ill in January of 1940? And by the way, <laughs> psychiatrists are involved in this, German psychiatrists. Well, Germany invades Poland in, in September 1939, right? They now need the food for soldiers and all. 
And you can see literally, basically, these mentally ill are useless eaters, and we now need to start killing them. So they begin a killing process with proper gases, just as Alexis Carroll had said might be good, in January 1940. And over the course of the next 18 months, they kill about 70,000 mentally patients. At that point, these small, institute, these small facilities for gassing people are dismantled. They're sent to the east of Germany, and there they're rebuilt for, you know, to start killing the Jews, etc. But the Holocaust begins with the mentally ill. And you can see why. They're seen as the most unfit in society, the most useless eaters. And Germany, even, you see uh, researchers, as they're killing mentally ill, they'll even calculate how much bread is being saved, this, and that sort of thing. Do you see how the Holocaust is the sort of end result of a long line of thinking? It's a long line of thinking that begins with some people are unfit and enemies of the state. It goes back to that very th first thing by Sir Francis Galton, and then you, if you want to trace the path that leads to the Holocaust, you ha I think you do have to say it comes to the United States, the seed of eugenesis, eugenics. It gets nurtured as a science here. It gets promoted to the United States, the pop population here. It's titans of American industry that fund it here and then help fund it in Germany as well. The point is there's a logic here in which it, it was developed under the cover of science. That's really the tragedy here. It was seen as a public health initiative, and it goes to this horrible end. Now, of course, we in the United States did not start killing our mentally ill. However, if you read in what happens to mental hospitals in the 1930s and 1940s, you will see the amount spent on mental hospitals drops and drops and drops. And you can say, okay, it's the depression states are you know, they're running out of money. That's true, but you can see how much is being spent on prisoners and how much is being spent on the mentally ill mental hospitals and much more is being spent on prisoners. Okay, so there's, a, there's in essence a, uh, you know, a designation going there. The mentally ill are the most worthless. Because of this, you see, um, you know, the facilities really fall into disrepair. And at the end of World War II, a journalist by the name of Albert Deutsch, Deutsch first in, a, in an essay in Life magazine and then in a book called The Shame of the States, he goes around with a photographer and he just documents what it's like in the state mental hospitals in this country. He takes pictures too. And in the photos you'll see people sitting around naked in some cases. You'll see basically, uh, you know, the places are deteriorated, sometimes feces just on the floor not being picked up, etc. And here's what he writes. And Byberry, by the way, is a mental hospital in Philly, I think. As I passed through some of Byberry's wards, I was reminded of the Nazi concentration camps at Belsen and Buchenwald. I entered buildings swarming with naked humans, herded like cattle, and treated with less concern, pervaded by a fetid odor so heavy, so nauseating, that the stench seemed to have almost a physical existence of its own. I saw hundreds of patients living under leaking roofs, surrounded by moldy, decaying walls and sprawling on rotting floors for want of seats or benches. All I'm saying is if you go to the mental hospitals, the shame of the states here, okay, the country does have a lot of financial pressures, but one of the reasons the state hospitals fall into such disrepair is because we have uh, devalued these people as unfit, okay, and that they're really a burden on society. So that's the mainstream story of uh, eugenics as it plays out from around, well, really, 1859, Darwin, to 1945, okay? What happens, of course, is after 1945 is eugenics becomes a shamed science. We sort of, we associate it with Nazi Germany, and we really don't want to look at how the U.S. in any way was involved with it and, and nurtured it. I want to do a couple more things here. So that's, we have this sense of the mentally ill being prevented from marrying, segregated in asylums, sterilized, and also said to be poisonous slime, et cetera, et cetera. What sort of medical treatments are brought into the mental hospitals while we have this conception of the mentally ill as essentially worthless human beings? 
Well, first of all, if you read the medical texts, sterilization is now promoted as something helpful for the mentally ill. And what the, because think of you're a doctor, right? If you're a doctor, whatever you do, you need to think of it as helpful for the person. You just have to. So what doctors will start saying is, by sterilizing these people, we remove from them the burden of their being anxious that they might one day have children. So it's sort of an anti-anxiety um, treatment. But what happens in the 1930s? We get uh, a group of therapies that were even dubbed brain-damaging therapies at the time. One was metrazole convulsive therapy. Metrazole is a poison. It would cause people to have these extraordinary seizures. People would break their backs. They would break other bones. Um, they, would break, they would break their teeth sometimes. And what happened was a couple things. One, of course, in order to, in, in terms of helping behavior, people would do anything not to have metrazole convulsive therapy. And so just the fear of it was seen as helpful. But also it did cause brain damage. Okay, and then when people came out of this convulsive therapy, they would be um, sort of like children. They would be needy. They would also be stunned, etc. So we had a therapy. So instead of ranching and whatever with their wild thoughts, they would come out of these convulsive therapies and be more childlike, needy, quiet, that sort of thing. Okay. And by the way, you wouldn't just get one metrazole treatment. You'd get multiple treatments. Another one of these brain damaging therapies introduced at the same time was insulin. Oh, by the way, one small thing. The rationale for metrazole convulsive theory was that by causing seizures, seizures were seen to be antithetical to schizophrenia, as an antidote to schizophrenia. The idea was that seizures would somehow drive the schizophrenia out. That was the idea. Mm -hmm. Another therapy at this time was called insulin coma therapy. So they would give people shots of insulin. Of course, that would withdraw so much sugar from the body, they would go into a hypoglycemic coma. Um, and then when they would come out of that, what would happen? The patients, again, would be sort of childish, helpless, quieter, that sort of thing. And again, though, to make it stick, you'd have to give them multiple insulin comas. At autopsy, they would show that there were lesions in the brain associated with insulin coma, etc. Then finally, we get electroshock therapy. Electroshock actually is initially developed as a way, uh, as a replacement for metrazole convulsive therapy, as a way to more reliably induce um, seizures. Um, again, they would uh, give multiple rounds of ECT. And again, someone coined these brain damaging therapeutics. And here is the important thing. And I'm going to read this thing. It's, Given that the mentally ill were seen as having not really in any worth, any intrinsic worth, the idea was that lowering them to a childlike state, a less intelligent state, was okay. Okay, because they're going to be less bothersome and plus they were not seen as having value as who they were. So you will read at the time, here's from a famous uh, psychiatrist at the time, Abraham My Myerson. I think it may be true that these people have for the time being at any rate more intelligence than they can handle. And the reduction of intelligence is an important part of the curative process. I say this without cynicism. The fact is that some of the very best cures that one gets are in those individuals whom one reduces almost to amentia. Amentia is another word for simple-mindedness. Okay, so you can see in this there is a transformation of being happening, sort of a lowered intelligence, but that is seen as good because it knocks out these delusions, these thoughts, etc., and they're now behave more childlike and, and less aggressive. The question, I think, is this. Does that happen if we do not have eugenic ideas of the mentally ill? In other words, unless we devalue who they are. Now, it's at this time that frontal lobotomy comes into asylum medicine. What is frontal lobotomy? And it, it's invented by a Portuguese surge, surgeon named Igaz Moniz. Imagine I have two brains, or I have two brains. I have a human brain and an ape brain. They will look virtually the same except for one thing. In the human brain, the frontal lobes will protrude. Okay, so this is seen as the part of the brain that makes us human. So in frontal lobotomy, the way it's done initially, they would put in an, uh, basically a scalpel on this side and this side. So imagine scalpels going in on each side. And then they would just say here, and then they would just run the scalpel up and down. So they would cut off the front of the lobes. 
Now initially what they would do is they'd just cut off a little sliver of the frontal lobes. And if that did not produce the desired change in being, they'd do it again and they'd cut off more of the frontal lobes and they would just keep retreating until they got more, you know, enough of the frontal lobes. Um, the neurologist that really became the Pied Piper of frontal lobotomy in this country was Walter Freeman. Uh, he came from a George, he was a neurologist at both Georgetown Medical School and George Washington Medical School in DC. And he developed a new technique for doing prefrontal lo uh, lobotomies very fast. He developed something called transorbital lobotomy. What he would do is he would, he would lie someone flat on a, you know, a bed or a cot or something, and then with a hammer, he would have ice picks. Imagine I'm here, and he would just drive the ice picks up into the brain through the eyes. Mm -hmm. And so he became able to scramble the frontal lobes in about 15 minutes. And he would go around every summer with his station wagon, and he would pull into a state asylum, a state mental hospital, and the superintendent would line up 15, 20 people who were candidates for frontal lobotomy, and he would do uh, 20 operations in the course of a morning. And he would even do it, in order to make them faster, he would, drive, he would drive the ice picks into each eye and then pull them up at the same time, and this way he could do it faster and faster. Now, here is what he, the master of frontal lobotomy, said this surgery did. He, the patient, is freed from anxiety and from feelings of inferiority. He loses interest in himself, both as to his body and as to his relationship with his environment, no longer caring whether his heart beats or his stomach churns, or whether his remarks embarrass his associates. His interests turn outward, and obsessive thinking is abolished. There is something childlike in the cheerful and unselfish unself-conscious behavior of the operated patient. You see how they say they're unself-conscious anymore? The reason is it's really the frontal lobes that give us self-consciousness. This is the part of the brain that allows us to sort of think about, you know, step outside and see who we are. So you take that away and that's basically what he's talking about here. Now in the 1940s they did assessments of the safety and efficacy of frontal lobotomy and the first such study of around, I think it was around 500 operations, concluded that 84% were improved or recovered and only 1% had worsened. Okay, again, this is seen as a positive change in being. Here's what the researcher concluded. It can be stated categorically that if this procedure is ineffect ineffectual in helping the patient, it will do no harm. The patient may not be improved, but he will not be made worse. Now in 1949, Igaz Moniz won the Nobel Prize in Medicine for inventing surgical lobotomy. And you can read in the New York Times and other, other mainstream publications how researchers, scientists, had come to know the inner workings of the brain like a master watchman knowing the, in, the inner workings of a complicated watch and had learned how to pluck madness from the brain without harming the rest of the brain. This idea took hold, and at one point they even began recommending that, uh, say, women, and it was women that this was given to, women at college who were anxious could be candidates for frontal lobotomy, and they, could they were said they could come in for a weekend lobotomy, and they were advised to uh, bring dark glasses, and then you could go home the same day, you would have the frontal lobe scrambled, and then you would no longer be anxious. I don't know the numbers, but there were front some women who were in essence were lobotomized just for anxiety as they went to college. Eventually it was also said to be okay for kids, and there was some even, I think the earliest that I saw lobotomized was a four-year-old. Mm -hmm. So again, how does lobotomy take hold, and how does it win the Nobel Prize in medicine? It only happens within a context where you devalue who the people were before the surgery. And basically you have people saying that the self-consciousness, and you'll even hear things, people who would worry about how history might have unfolded if the indigenous people of America had won. Those sort of inventive people no longer worried about such thoughts. You'll hear that as seen as a good outcome. I'm gonna go real briefly now to, you know, how eugenics played out for African Americans. And then we'll go to this thing about um, 
Do we see eugenics today say in the treatments of the mentally ill? With African Americans, it's a little bit more complicated, basically because the denigration of blacks started much earlier, before the eugenics. It really happens in the, during the slave era, of course. You have southern physicians saying uh, that the blacks, in essence, are a separate species. They have distinct pulmonary things, uh, heart systems, etc. You'll see claims that really, if we rank species, we have the apes, we have the blacks, and then we have whites. The idea was that the black skull also closed early at age 13, and therefore they were incapable of higher intellectual functions. So this, is, this begins to take hold in um, prior to the Civil War. There's also a Swiss, uh, famous Swiss biologist at Harvard University, Swiss-born, named Louis Agassiz. He's so well known. I'm from Cambridge, where Harvard University is. Up until recently, there was an Agassiz school. Well, Agassiz, Louis Agassiz in the 1800s taught his students that blacks were a separate species. So this was being taught at Harvard University. So this is prior to this. We get the freedmen in, eight, you know, the 14th, you know, we get the, 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 the freeing of the slaves at the end of the Civil War. We have about 12 years of reconstruction where they're giving voting privileges, et cetera. Now what happens, of course, is we're, the South wants to set up a Jim Crow society where we're going to basically find reasons to segregate blacks, deny them voting rights, et cetera, where you can see how the eugenics ideas fit into that social policy. I don't think it's totally, uh, it's not just an accident. The Jim Crow laws start happening in the 1890s. That's when they come in. At the same time, these eugenic ideas are being promoted. And so, um, as these ideas come in, here's what you'll read at. Here's the sort of things you'll read about black people. Um, Lester Ward, a professor of sociology at Brown University, reasons that a black man is, is moved to rape a white woman because he realizes that mating with, quote, a more advanced being would, quote, raise his race to a little higher level. We have the Richard Examiner at this time writing that science has now shown that Negroes are not men in the sense which that term is used by the Declaration of Independence. Again, it's this grading of certain human beings as less fit. Here's the editors of American Medicine. It's a journal in 1907. They say, if you, if you review the evidence, the scientific evidence, the Negro cannot comprehend higher studies any more than a horse can understand the rule of three. Now, I have to say, I don't even know what the rule of three is, <laughs> so I guess I don't understand it either. But they conclude, quote, if these anatomical facts had been known at the end of the Civil War, then the country would not have made the tragic mistakes of giving, mistake of giving Negroes the right to vote. Quote, leaders in all political parties now acknowledge the air of human equality. This is as these Jim Crow policies are setting in place. It's also as lynching really takes hold. Lynching really begins in the 1890s. And you can see why if we're going to say certain people are enemies of the state. Now here's a quote as from Charles Eliot, president of Harvard University at this time, as to why they basically do not want blacks and whites eating together. He says, in a democracy, civilized white men don't want to rub elbows with, quote, barbarous black men. Again, you see this eugenic idea. Now the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People is founded in 1909. There's a meeting here in New York at the Charity Organization Hall and it's called the National Negro Conference. And here's what's so telling. The very first presentation, and I always mispronounce, by W.E.B. Du Bois, the great you know, black radical, so to speak, fighting for rights and all. His first question to the audience is this. He puts three brains on display. One's of an ape, one's of a black man, one's of a white man. Why is he doing this? Because he wants to show which, are, is there some sort of gradation in the brains? Or are there two brains you can't tell anything apart? And of course, you can't. But the ape brain is notably different. But he does say this. Watch what he says. The very first question at the uh, uh, founding of the uh, NACP, he says this. From the standpoint of modern science, are Negroes men? And that's because in the eugenics sort of idea of unfit and grading of human beings is that they were not. There's some sense of that. So that's what he's fighting again. 
So what's my point to you? Jim Crow, as you know, lasts, in essence, from the 1890s to the 1960s. It's 70 years. Can that, I'm Jim Crow policies that prevent blacks from voting, et cetera, the segregation, et cetera. Can that happen if we do not have eugenic ideas towards certain people? I don't know, I think they go hand in hand about declaring certain people unfit and less than equal. All right, now if you write about that there's any eugenic ideas towards the mentally ill today, as I did not long ago, you will hear it, that people don't appreciate this thought. But let's go forward and see if there is any sort of similarity to some things that are happening today. First of all, if you, when, when the antipsychotics come into uh, psychiatric care in 1945, 1955, that's when Thorazine comes into asylum medicine. They're still doing surgical lobotomies. You know how they describe the drugs? As chemical lobotomies. But not negatively. That's positive. That means it's a drug substitute for a surgery that is seen as having a benefit. All I'm saying is there's a, de there's a continuation now of a therapy that causes a change in being similar to what they saw with surgical lobotomy. And today, in modern histories, we say that uh, Thorazine, the arrival of Thorazine, kicked off a psychopharmacological revolution as a great in advancing care as the introduction of antibiotics in asylum medicine. That's sort of the official history. But if we go back, the drugs are initially welcomed for causing a change in being similar to what you see in surgical lobotomy. So the devaluing, I think, is still present at that time. Now, how do we assess the merits of antipsychotics today? If you go in the literature as to why they're effective, it's two things. Well, basically, it's this. People come into an emergency room, you knock down the psychotic symptoms better than placebo, okay? That's, that's over six weeks, that's why the drugs are effective. Then they run these studies, they take away the drug, and those where the drug is, is taken away, they relapse. They have a return of psychotic symptoms greater than those in the drug-maintained group. What is relapse? It means you get rehospitalized. So you now are costing the society money in essence. Does any of that literature tell you what people are doing? Does it tell you about whether they're working? Are they enjoying life? Are they mating with people? That sort of thing. And from 1945 to 1955, if you look at first episode schizophrenia patients, more than half were working at five years later. You'd see a lot actually marrying. There was a, an early study about two-thirds of the women actually were mating up. Go look at schizophrenia patients today, people so diagnosed. The, the, people, uh, the employment rates is like 10%, and the, the percentage of people having kids is way, way down. Okay, and there's a lot of sexual dysfunction with the drugs. The point is, in how we assess the merits of treatments today for people with psychotic disorders, schizophrenia, etc., it's not about what they can do, and it's not about whether they're enjoying life or any of those measures. It's about whether or not they have symptoms that often land them back in the hospital, okay? Mm -hmm. That's the, what we measure. And I will tell you something of this. There's a recent study done by Martin Harrell. He's a University of Illinois College of Medicine. It's a long-term study, it's the only one we have, uh, that followed a group of psychotic patients from 1980 forward, 200 psychotic patients, okay? He managed to keep 145 of these patients in his study for 15 and 20 years. The purpose of the study, the reason you all funded it as American taxpayers, was to see what happened to people who went off their meds. So in this study, everybody was treated conventionally with drugs, okay? And then they're just followed for 15 years. And he ends up with 64 schizophrenia patients. 25 are off, and, and the re remaining part remain on drugs, 39. Well, what does he report? He reports the outcomes, and it's a naturalistic study. Everybody treated with drugs, and then he just follows them. People are free to go off, et cetera. And basically, as I said, 25 to 64 go off, and he follows them at two, four and a half, seven and a half, 10 and 15 years. What does he find? First of all, he finds that of those off medication, more than half work, okay? More than half, about 40% of them become asymptomatic. They end up recovered, working, et cetera. The percentage that, so the recovery rate for those off medication and recovery included working half time was 40%. 
the percentage on medication was 5%. Okay? And all his things, on all his different outcome measures, there's a lot of outcome measures. The off medication group does markedly better every, in every single measurement. Okay? In his milder psychotic disorders group, it's the same thing. Okay? It's those who get off do much, much better. And the other thing here is this. So many of them are just not psychotic, okay? The symptoms pass, they go back to work, etc. How many of you have heard of that study? Did you read about it in the New York Times? No. You read about it in any magazine? Okay, why not? It doesn't fit with a standard of care that does produce a lot of profits. All I'm going to say is this. So it doesn't fit What's with the name that I Martin Harrell. Okay? He just came out with his 20-year data, and it's even more profound, this 20-year data. The differences are extraordinary. The recovery rate of those who stayed on medications through the 20 years, only 17% ever had a period of recovery. For those who got off medication and stayed off, 87% had sustained periods of recovery. It is dramatically different. But my point to you as a society, why don't we know this? You just said because of money, it does threaten uh, a... Um, a standard of care. Now let me ask you this. If you had heart patients where you had this sort of outcome of an, a, a medical treatment, would it be published? No. Who said no? You don't think it would be published? No. <laughs> you're more cynical than even I am. <laughs> I think it would be. I just don't think you're going to have a major study like this in heart that would not. I think this only happened. I don't think um, we can talk about this. I think it's again a sign that we're not valuing certain groups of people as other groups of people. The other thing, and I'm not going to get into this because I have to too long. The whole chemical imbalance story—it's not true. Okay, if you actually talk to the researchers, they say I was I was given a grand rounds at Massachusetts General Hospital uh, a year ago in January. If any of you have read Anatomy of an Epidemic, you can see why people are unhappy with that book. So I'm there, and one of the things that the psychiatrists are complaining about is how I've said they told false stories about the mentally ill. And I said, well, you, you told us that we had chemical imbalances, and yet when you look about this, when you look at the research, you find it wasn't so. And this comes out. And you know what they told me? So what was their response? This is MGH, Massachusetts General Hospital. They said, oh, we haven't been telling people, we, we haven't told people that for 25 years. We knew that was an outdated model 25 years ago. And I said to them this. I said, it's true, you did know. Because actually, that's when it fell apart. You did know that the chemical imbalance story was false 25 years ago. But I think you failed to communicate it to the public. <laughs> and there were some heads nodding like that. There's a recent note, by the way, by Ronald Pies in Psychiatric Times. He says this. This theory of chemical imbalances is an urban myth. Okay? I don't know of any well-informed psychiatrist who ever propounded, proposed that chemical imbalances were a primary cause of mental disorders. He, he says, it was only proposed by opponents of psychiatry to make psychiatrists look bad. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's not what happened. But the point is, the point is, what other group of people get told that they have something physiologically wrong when we don't know that to be true. Finally, there's this. You know, we're doing, so, you know the broken brain idea, you have chemical imbalances? So the idea with a broken brain is, again, there's something fundamentally wrong with you, right? We have, we have normal people over here, and we have people with broken brains. How different is that in terms of saying people who are fit and unfit? Especially when everything you can look at in the science tells you this. Anybody with the wrong stressors and all, the wrong trauma, stop to sleep, can move over here. By that I mean they can become psychotic, they can become manic, etc. And there's plenty of evidence that with the right care, once you have that, you can move back over here, and by that I mean not have such symptoms. But in order to sort of tell a story that helps sell drugs, we are being telling a story that either you have a broken brain, a chemical imbalance, and need drugs for life, or you're normal, right? That's still setting up this line that divides human beings into the fit and the unfit. And you also hear all these stories that they're finding genes for this and that, right? 
Well, they've been finding genes for that ever since Aaron Rosenoff in 1908 said there was a normal gene and an insane gene. Here's what I will tell you what happens with the genetics of mental disorders. There's a steady, there's an ever, there's always this announcement, we found the gene or genes, and then people try to replicate it and they can never really replicate it. So there's just some recent announcement, et cetera, et cetera. My favorite uh, comment on this is by Andrew Skoll, a British historian of medicine. He says, <laughs> waiting for, I forget exactly what, but basically he says, waiting for the, uh, for the discovery of the biological causes of, of mental illness is like waiting for Godot. <laughs> it just never quite arrives. Anyway, well, well that's, I'll, I'll stop here. So the question for us, I think, as a society today, we look in the past, I think we're ashamed by eugenics, right? This sort of dividing of humans into the fits and unfits. We're ashamed by forced sterilization. And then my question to us as a society is, are we embracing eugenic conceptions today when we talk about chemical imbalances, et cetera? Uh, are we saying that there are normal and abnormal people? And what does that lend itself to? And also, you know where I was earlier today? I was, and what happens to people when they get deemed abnormal and under state care? Where I was at earlier today, I was giving a talk to the Association of Lawyers who, who um, represent people who are being forcibly medicated and given forceful, forcible ECT. And they shared with me some of the um, court orders. Here's an example of one. One man was being ordered to have electroshock twice a week for 55 weeks. 150 forced electroshocks. Another one, 400 forced electroshocks. Not one, not two, 400. Others you would see drug order that would be like Haldol, a newer drug, a benzodiazepine, five, six drugs, forcibly medicated, etc. We also have an expansion of outpatient, assisted outpatient commitment laws. You know what those are? What happens is you get released from the mental hospital, but you still don't really get your civil liberties back. And so you're allowed to be in the community, but you're forced to take drugs if you want to stay in the community. This is spreading like wildfire, mm -hmm. uh, these out assisted outpatient. All I can say is if you're under an assisted outpatient order, you are not someone with full civil rights. Okay, because you're being forced to take medications you may not want to take. So, are these medical policies, or are these social policies, and are they social policies? This is the question for you all. I'm pretty sure they're not born of good science, but do they reflect this thing that we as a society are continuing to say that there's this line separating the fit from the unfit, the normal from the abnormal? I think we still are embracing that same idea, and I think history is telling us it's not a good idea. So, thanks. Okay, so, um, I, yeah, I'll, I'll take some questions, and I see some hands. Uh, one, two, three, uh, we'll start, or maybe I'll change that a little bit. Right there. <coughs> Um, uh, thanks. This, this was fascinating stuff. Um, I have a, a question and a comment. Uh, the question is, when, when, was there a working definition of unfit or, or defective? How, how, how would it manifest? What are the characteristics? If I'm walking down the street or if I'm in a salon or a restaurant, how do I recognize somebody who's defective? And that's the question. Um, the, the comment... Um, it, it, it's, it's kind of fascinating that going into the 19, from the late 30s, going into the 40s, into the 50s, uh, at the same time that, that eugenics had really taken off and had really become entrenched, you also had psychoanalysis uh, counterposed against it. It, it. it almost achieved fat status. Um, and, and I'm thinking of films like, like uh, The Snake Pit with Olivia de Havilland. Mm -hmm. Where, where the, the, uh, the promise, this great promise of psychoanalysis, talking out your problems, getting well through the process of, of just lying on the couch and, and speaking, could cure mental illness. Um, 
So to me, it's kind of interesting that, that in popular culture, uh, that was counterposed to the eugenics movement. Right. Um, but you know, it, 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 didn't, it seems not to have taken off, uh, other than maybe among the rich who could afford therapy. And it, it also seems like some of the DSM classifications really have their antecedents in the ideology of eugenics going back to the 20s and 30s. Right, so three points he's making here. One is, how did they figure out who was defective? Obviously, good question. <laughs> um, one thing they would just go to people in, in prisons, asylums, and say, this is our defectives. But then they would also, the idea, you know, who's defective? Someone who's different from me is more likely to be seen as defective. In other words, who has different cultures, different behaviors, et cetera, um, different class. So someone who, and you can read about, say someone's at a street corner preaching about, you know, class unfairness. Well, maybe that person is seen as deluded and now becomes seen as defective. My point is there's not, you know, certainly if someone has a genetic thing, you know, if they have Down syndrome, that sort of thing, mental retardation was seen as a sign of being defective. Anybody who was manic, psychotic in the hospital, that's defective. Criminals were seen as defective. Antisocial behavior is seen as defective. So it becomes this basically, this mass of people who are different and in some ways are, are putting some financial burden on society in some ways. So, so it's just sufficiently outside the dominant culture. Basically that's it, you know? And, and when they did this, they had 10% you saw when the field workers came out who were defective. Depending on how you define it, you could make 15%, 20%. That's number one. Psychoanalysis. Psychoanalysis seems to be a counter to um, eugenic ideas. Yes, but who does psychoanalysis? Psychoanalysis was for the rich, for neurotic problems. It really wasn't even seen really for the psychotic patients and the low class patients. So rather than seeing, it's almost like celebrating the complexity of the rich, right? And, and, and their extraordinary minds. Now there was some effort to sort of apply psychoanalytic theory to say frontal lobotomy, and this is great stuff. They'll, they'll show, they'll have one point, frontal lobotomy, why does it work? And had this one drawing like the doctor's coming in and he's untying the ego and the id and he's separating them out. It's complete ridiculousness. But that's the difference on psychoanalytic thing. It's really a different class of patients. So you can see why they can still be in the same society. And then the third question of DSM, DSM-3. DSM-3 is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. It comes in 1980. The importance is this. Prior to DSM-1 and DSM-2 are not strict boundaries of normal and abnormal, okay? There's this sort of spectrum of neurosis, et cetera. There's sort of psychodynamic conceptions. 1980, they're gonna say mental disorders are brain diseases, just like heart disease, et cetera. And you either have it or you don't. That's sort of the idea. You either have major depression, you either have schizophrenia, or you don't. You know, and they have these ideas to draw a line. The line is completely arbitrary, but that's not what they say. So yeah, this is the point. DSM-3, with this idea that there's this fine line, you either have a broken brain or you don't, really sort of sets up again this idea of fit and unfit, right? And again, it's not transient. It's you, you are bipolar. You are schizophrenic, you have a chemical imbalance. So the DSM-3 really is identifying this line. And the crazy, the crazy thing is with, you know, we now have DSM-4 and DSM-5, is it's also married, of course, to commercial purposes that want to expand the boundaries of the abnormal as greatly as possible. I've been doing a lot of talks recently in uh, different schools, colleges. What percentage of entering freshmen in colleges now arrive with a diagnosis and a prescription? Any idea? Um, I'm just going to throw out a random guess, uh, 40, 50%. Okay, what I'm hearing is 30%, okay? So think about this, 30% of our freshmen, our 18-year-olds, have now grown up in a society that say they're not quite right. Boy, that is a lot of... Our high-functioning 18-year-olds who are in college. Yeah, these are people going to Dartmouth. Yeah. I was at Dartmouth. Oh. This, is, this is people at the best schools. <laughs> Exactly right. I, I gave a talk at this Association of Liberal Arts Colleges in New England, and they're actually studying this, and they're up to 28%. These are the kids getting like, you know, 2200s on their SATs or whatever. You know, it's just crazy. But anyway, going to this 
these kids are getting the message that they're bipolar, they're ADHD, they're not quite right. It's a Thank you again, very, very good talk. Uh, does the Snopes trial tie into the eugenics movement as a counter reaction? And my second question is, today you see the elites that have made public their mental problems, bipolar disorders, manic depression, and so forth. So the Snopes trial, of course, is the famous trial with, uh, on the theory of evolution, basically, right? And um, also goes to the sense of, God, I gotta remember exactly the Snopes trial. It's Clarence Darrow, right? It's in the 20s. It's in the 20s, but it has to do with whether human beings evolve or not, right? And the teaching yes. of that. Whether human beings are descended from apes. Are descended from apes or they have an inequality. They're humans. They're right. Beings in or made by God, so to made speak. By God. Yes, yeah. it is. But is it a reaction to the eugenics movement, the scientific movement? Oh, that's a good question. Scientific movement. Too irrational. Yeah. Ideas clashing. I'd say yes. I mean, in a certain sense, is the idea that species evolve is associated with the eugenics movement, right? I mean, they come out of Darwin, so you have this is this is there's sometimes odd bedfellows, right? So in some ways, of course, we see scientists that embrace evolution as you know smart, right? That's what educated, thoughtful people do. And that's really what Clarence Darrow is defending in the Snopes, that trial, and the right to teach evolution. The problem is, what happens with eugenics is an example of science being put to a bad end. Yes. So that's really the difference here. I think you can defend evolution, of course, but that doesn't mean you should be characterizing people as unfit and unfit. So that's how that's different. And then the second thing you just asked, I'm sorry? About the elites in our country. Right. That are not inhibited from explaining that they have mental disorders. Right. And in some cases, they are on medication. Like right. Turner, the news magnet, and other Hollywood people and so forth, political figures. Right. Well, one of the things that the pharmaceutical psychiatry complex, so to speak, <laughs> has done a very good job of is basically selling medications. And, you know, in 1987, for example, we spent $800 million in psychiatric medications in this country. In 2007, we spent $40 billion. That's a 50-fold increase. So basically, this capitalistic enterprise of selling medications and getting people diagnosed you know, through ad advertising, et cetera, has been very good at getting us to see ourselves as bipolar or you know, ADHD, et cetera, et cetera. So they've done very good at expanding the boundaries of what we consider disordered, I guess, you know, psychiatric trouble, psychiatrically troubled. But why are the elite embracing this? I don't know. <laughs> I don't really know on this. This is really a, a good question because actually, you know, it's part of a larger philosophy, philosophical change that I don't really, I, I'm not, you can see I'm stumbling on this. In 1987, the NIMH conducted a survey of the American population about depression. And the, the population said this, depression passes, and two, you have to make changes in response to depression. You go to a counselor, et cetera, and you make changes in your life. There's things that are making you unhappy. So it's seen as two things. Within yourself, you're empowered to make changes, and it will pass. Then what happened is the NIMH then um, began um, running a campaign. It was called the DART Campaign. It was funded partially by Eli Lilly. And it was done to convince Americans that depression is a brain disease, OK? And it's permanent, and you need to be on Prozac, and that it's caused by low serotonin. And today, 80% of Americans know that depression is caused by low serotonin. Now, it's not true, but they know that. It's an example of how successful this storytelling has become. And what it's done is shift us as a people of philosophy away from self-resilience and sort of self-responsibility. For your own mind, my own opinion is one of the things we humans do 
is we're born with this mind and we spend a lot of times grappling with it and trying to make peace with it. That's sort of a fundamental thing human beings do. I actually don't think it's that easy being human. It's, your mind can be a very troubled place. But that's part of what used to be life. That was part of the existential struggle. And we've changed that. And now we have this idea that we're sort of victims, right? We're not self-responsible, it's our... Why it's being embraced by the elite, I don't quite know, but that somehow it's being done. And I, I just don't have a good answer for you. What's that? Right. 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 The the pharmaceutical industry would fund this. Uh, you also did have a, you know Nami got behind this. And <coughs> Nami, of course, were mothers who were being blamed for schizophrenic sons and daughters. Right. So they wanted to get out of it. By the way, as they run anti-stigma campaigns in country after country, stigma goes up. Um, I'm next thing. Okay. Hi. Thank you so much for having this today. Um, it was really uh, broad. I was wondering if you could just say again the name of the person who started uh, the eugenics. Uh, the first part of your talk. What was the name of that person? In, 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 in England or in the United States? In England. Yeah, that's Sir Francis Galton. Okay. And you said, if I got it, that he looked at the class system and he saw what you just said instead of the class system, right? Yeah, so he looks at all these high achievers in England and he says, oh, these people are the special people. But of course they're coming from the elite. They're, you know, they're, these are, the, these are the, the daughters and sons of the, you know, the richest people, so of course they're writers and scientists because they don't have to work. Right. So uh, I was wondering if you might consider this in your next talk to speak a little bit more clearly and specifically, out openly. I heard you finally say campus at the end, which was great, but really say it out loud, because I'm sure you're familiar with Michelle Alexander, uh, the new Jim Crow. Oh, sure, she, the, she wrote the book. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Because what I see happening in the talk is I could get sort of um, bamboozled into not realizing that there is a real financial buttressing of this whole ideology. And I would like to ask you to consider that, to say really clearly, look, the finance capitalists of the world, they come up with ideology so that they can separate us. That's one point I'd like to leave you say something about that. And then the other thing is, so when you were talking with the lawyers, were they able to tell you that most of the people that they're talking about are of color that are being in these prisons? Yeah. Um, okay, so so I saw your face and I get that that's a yes because I work in jail. And so sure, you know the answer is yes. Yeah, course. yeah, but just to say that openly, because you know what? I myself, who is of color, when I started working in the jail, I came home shocked. I said, damn, I haven't seen a white guy in here in four years. <laughs> so this is something to really state openly right. so that you can say, possibly, I'd just like the idea of the old Jim Crow ended in the 60s. And the new Jim Crow is blah, blah, blah. That might help to really uh, broaden this conversation so that people see that, uh, once again, racism is used. Oh, and I want to say one thing about women. Members. Racism is used to divide us to 99%. Because, of course, we think, well, this is just some general thing. But is it really that it's racist? Because that's how you're going to deny whole people the right to vote. And the last thing is women and men. I don't know if you've heard of that. OK, so I'll, I won't say anything about it, but I'll just recommend it to people. How you know, men can use this against women that they're married to, you know? Because they her ass because she's a little bit too rebellious. So all those points, I'd love to hear what you have to say. That's a whole other talk. <laughs> exactly. But, but here's, let me say a couple things here. These are really important points. One of the things that happened with this talk, I was talking sort of about the mentally ill, but the, the, there's a whole story to be done about race. You're absolutely true. My third book, actually, called On the Laps of Gods, got started out with this question. Why do we imprison black men at such a high rate? So there's no ethnic group anywhere in the United States, anywhere in the world that is imprisoned at the rate of black men in the United States. So actually, I was beginning to try to do the same thing I'd done for in Mad America with the mentally ill, was to trace the history of blacks in the criminal justice system. And I got, I got lost because of this extraordinary case in 1919, 
it's, it's a racial history. It just it presents American criminal law in a very different case. And then he rose as really the first great civil rights attorney in the United States, this guy named Cyprian Afghanistan. But here's your point. When do blacks start being imprisoned at great, great rates? What year? 1965. There it is. So the yeah, Voting is. Rights Act, and next thing you know, you have drug acts yeah. that start imprisoning, and I worked in Attica prison, by the way, in the 1970s. And, uh, and I came in right after the riots, or shortly after the riots. And so what do you find there? You find guys selling drugs. I mean, that's why they were there, sort of entrepreneurs there that basically were following, you know, certain opportunities. And next thing you know, they're in Attica, they're in these prisons, etc. So this is what the book's talking about, as how they are disenfranchising the blacks today. And who is the they? Well, that's a good question. <laughs> who do you think is the they? Well, I would say that it's a system of a capitalist uh, class. But uh, I want you to say, because you're the one who, who've come to talk to me. Well, sure, come on. There's a ruling group here, right? I yes, mean, there's but a ruling. you say it because, you see, you have credentials of blah, blah, blah. I'm the lady in the back who makes the comments. So it's very <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I mean, here's one of the things that I think uh, we need histories. We need, we need to have histories you know, people's histories, as opposed to histories of the winners, so to speak. Because, you know, so often the history that is told in the United States really is a history sort of told by the elite, etc. What Michelle Alexander has done in this book, she's, she's getting us a, a way to look at this, how the system is disenfranchising huge blocks of voters, etc. Why is that? Well, I think you have to see it tied to the Voting Rights Act. That's my feeling. So, and now clearly there are groups in power, who those groups are, that have a certain desire to maintain certain status quo, right? And certain, so the point, you know, we're also seeing in the United States, it's both class and race. We're becoming a very class rigid society. Even there's less class movement than in a lot of European societies today. You know, I'm not a scholar of this sort of uh, class rigidity. I'm not a scholar really of, say, um, where are the origins, origins of these policies that do disenfranchise groups in so many different ways. But you could become that because then what that does is give us hope as how to transform it. Is if we know, oh, it's a capitalist class, it's a capitalist system that makes this happen, then we say, oh, so we need to get rid of that system so that we can transform these ideas, policies, and um, actions. Well, I mean, you certainly can see, listen, as we know, there's the money's being ever more concentrated at the very top, right? And we, just listen to this. So one of the ideas is, oh, we, we can't tax the rich because they make all the jobs, right? So we hear this about the Republicans, et cetera. And you hear that repeated in certain media. Well, that's a story about how the fit, so to speak, need to be favored in our society. I mean, it's completely ludicrous. You know, one small thing, my daughter teaches, <laughs> my daughter teaches high school in a Brooklyn high school. And you know, her tax rate is about, I don't know, by the time you add up all the taxes, it's like 40, 45%. You know, Warren Buffett's playing 18% or something, or 15%. So my daughter's paying like three times what Warren Buffett's paying. I mean, it's just so insane. Uh, and obviously, we're having these things because, uh, you know, there's a certain ruling elite, obviously, is what's happening. Look at the Supreme Court decision that said, you know, corporations are people, that sort of thing. By the way, the corporations are people, that goes back to decisions made in the 1890s. So the 14th Amendment was passed to give equal rights and the protection of the Constitution to the freedmen, right? That's why we have the 14th Amendment. And you can read in a series of decisions in the late 1800s in which, in essence, the U.S. Supreme Court withdraws the protection of the 14th Amendment to protect the, to protect the rights of the freedmen, right? At the same time, they are using the 14th Amendment to protect the rights of railroad owners. Mm -hmm. So that decision goes back to the 1890s, a discredited decision. Anyway, these are great points. And uh, as women, it's, there's a long thing about diagnosing women, sending women off to the uh, mental asylum, that sort of thing. Um, one great study. Now you got me going. <laughs> okay, yeah. oh. okay, one real quick study. There was a study done in which they had 
symptoms that they went to psychiatrists. And the symptoms were the same in every case note except one thing was changed in this study. It was identified either as black male, black female, white male, white female. And then what's the diagnosis? So which group was most likely to be diagnosed schizophrenic? Same symptoms. What's that? Black male. What was second? Black, no, black female. Most likely. Third? White female. The least likely to be diagnosed schizophrenic was white men. Why? Because white men were doing the diagnosis. Yeah. What were the number of book sales with regards to eugenics as far as how are these being read properly throughout the United States? Um, and when did eugenics stop being taught in universities? Uh, also, who's paying for the sermons as far as the, the funding of those prizes? And then there's a new uh, theory out, a book out, talking about uh, Darwin as being the greatest economist ever, right? And um, so there's thought as far as with that. And I'm not sure if you know, as far as the OSS, which was a predecessor to the CIA, that the funding for that and anthropologists were being funded by the foundations, like Rockefeller, exact same foundations that were funding uh, the eugenics programs. And their anthropological viewpoints and their studies that they were doing on indigenous people around the world echo as far as the eugenics, but also that as far as capitalism, as far as being put forth forward. And my question for you is, that how did eugenics play in the story of the development of capitalism and how capitalism was spun in the US, but also as it was propagated imperialistically across the world. And if you, if you look at that as far as like the funding of the foundations, because it's the exact same funding uh, mechanisms and same funding sources. Okay, a lot of questions there. <laughs> Just a couple things. In 1937, Fortune uh, uh, surveyed the population. 67% of Americans favored forced sterilization. Okay, so that tells you it's popular, popularizing. It begins to fall out of favor, though, in the late 30s and early 40s, because once we start fighting Nazi Germany, okay, and there's some recognition that n Germany is a eugenics country. And especially after 1945, it becomes a discredited science, and it gets swept from our textbooks. The, the history of eugenics, basically, because it's associated with the Holocaust. So that's that. What was the question on the capitalism? <laughs> uh, as far as to, to what extent did the speaking of eugenics and the whole story of eugenics affect the story of capitalism? Okay, because I can answer the this. the titans of industry, right. Carnegie, Rockefeller, et cetera, that are funding this, right. but they're also the titans who are pushing this form of capitalism that, that we have. Right, so, so capital, so, you know, I, again, you can see how they somewhat go hand in hand. I, and almost, you know when the CEOs are getting like $50 million to run a company? There was this an article, a column in the Boston Globe, they really believe they're worth it? That's sort of the sense of I'm the most fit, right? Yeah. I'm the superior human being. And it's part of the idea if you're running a big company, a successful capitalistic company, it is survival of the fittest, right? And so the rewards go to the most fit companies. It doesn't go to those who manage to capture markets, that sort of thing. Um, so if we see the rise of capitalism in the, and the, the real embrace in the 1880s, 1890s, their influence over the Supreme Court, et cetera, that would be a great study. How much do eugenic ideas go hand in hand with the rise of the railroads? I don't know. You're shaking your heads. I don't know. It'd be a great study. You, two separate things. I mean, everything's interrelated. Yeah, two separate things. And I'm not the guy to, to, to assess this. So anyway. Sure. Um, I was giving grand rounds recently at uh, Western Kentucky. And uh, I give a little talk, and the, the head of research goes, all this research is worthless. Why? He says, there's no such thing as schizophrenia. Schizophrenia is a term for a lot of different sort of symptoms. And anybody really in the field talks about a group of schizophrenias. So really, you're talking about many different things. So how can there be one schizophrenic gene or one group when you're talking about many different things? 
there was a, a, there's a couple things with the, the genetics and schizophrenia. Some of that data actually goes back to Nazi Germany, okay? That is used to say that there's some vulnerability. I think there may be, in some instances, some genetic vulnerability to psychosis. I really do. That's a lot different than saying there's a gene for schizophrenia or that it's a, just a genetic disease. I, I, but I do think there can be some vulnerabilities to stress, trauma, disorganization, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, I, I think that's the answer. Okay. Yeah? Hi, I have a question and a comment. And the question that I also had when I was reading an about the longitudinal study that you mentioned today. Do those, studies, do those studies control at all, since these are episodic illnesses and long-term illnesses, do they control at all for people who go off medication because they're better? I mean, it seems like a lot of people who have episodic illnesses, and schizophrenia has a course that can either get better, stay the same, or get worse. So it would seem to me that a lot of people who get off medication do better because they feel better, they get off medication, and they don't relapse. Right. So they do better. Right. But I, which is different than trying to encourage people that if they get off medication, they'll do better, and the medication is making them sick. Yeah. Go ahead. That's the question. That's the question. And, um, the comment. No, I don't even remember what the comment was. Wait a second. Um, oh, it was about that at least we should, I think, mention in this kind of group the recovery movement, which is a growing movement among, and you did mention it in your book, which is a growing movement among um, people diagnosed with mental illnesses themselves. Um, their slogan is a lot of um, nothing about us without us. Um, they call themselves things like survivors of the mental health system. And they figure out good stuff. What was the last answer? They figure out a lot of a lot of good things, a lot of right, sort of self determination. Self determination and feelings of um, you know lots of ways that you can live in the world. There isn't just one standard of how you can right. live. And well, I think it's you know the research shows that there are, a lot of them do pretty well. Yeah. <coughs> Did you mention the book that since she just asked about the... Uh, uh, well, why don't you mention it? Go ahead. Hold up your book. Yeah, you asked about it, and I just... I'm an uh, anti-establishment... What's your name? My name is Seth Farber. I'm an anti-establishment psychologist. I've written four or five books, and my last one just came out. You can get it at Amazon. It's... Uh, Bob wrote a, uh, one, one of the people who wrote a, endorsements for it, and it's called The Spiritual Gift of Madness. And it's the subtitle is The Failure of Psychiatry and the Rise of the Mad Pride Movement. So I talk about how the Mad Pride Movement begun in the, uh, the, the history of it, beginning in the mental patients' liberation, the psychiatric survivors, and now a more popular term is the Mad Movement. Anyway, I go into theory and, and as well as uh, history and, and what's going on today. So I just want to mention, I have a, uh, a, a press release if you want to pick it up. And you can get this at, at Am on Amazon. So let me uh, answer your question right. about uh, it's just a matter of people who are better going off that say have an episodic form of the disorder, and that's what you're seeing. By the way, I, I, in the anatomy of an epidemic, I'm not encouraging. That's not a medical advice book, right? No, I know. Yeah, yeah. I'm not encouraging anybody to go off meds. I just think we need to know this information. Here's the thing. With, so the Martin Harrow study, if you read it, it makes it seem that that's what's happening, okay? He says it's those with a good prognosis who are going off meds and doing better. So it's not the meds, it's just that there's a subset of people, perhaps with a lot milder form, who are going off and doing well. The problem is that interpretation is belied by the evidence itself. So within the good prognostic categories, those who got off did better than those who did on, stayed on. In the bad prognostic category, those who got off did better than those who stayed on. Most importantly, those with milder disorders initially who stayed on meds did worse than schizophrenia patients who got off. So th that's that milder group would have a better prognosis. So again, I'm not saying anything about whether people should be taking meds or not. I just think this, medic this needs to be known as part of what is the information that's out there. My own interpretation of the Harrow study, though, 
it's, it's pretty damning evidence that over the long term, the drug's worse than the long term course of psychotic disorders. And he's got a new paper coming out that he basically raises that question in the 20 years. But that's my interpretation of the data that he presents. The only thing I want to say, and I think I actually agree with you, but the only thing I want to say is that prognosis and schizophrenia, prognosis and schizophrenia and depression is very tricky. Someone could be extremely severely depressed or psychotic and get better and never have another episode. So what well, you guess is going to happen isn't, it's not like in cancer, sometimes it might be easier to decide a prognosis from what you see. Well, see, I completely agree with you that these were often episodic problems. We sort of reconceived them as chronic problems. But if you actually look at the data, they were often episodic. The only thing I'm saying is when we go back to that initial group of patients in the, in the, in the Harrow group, we don't know who's going to be episodic and who's not. We have these different subsets. And in every subset, it was those who got off who did much better. By the way, I, I hate to say this, I've got to leave in about uh, 10 okay. minutes. Oh, so we have time for ten, no, we've got 10 more minutes. Do you have more questions? Okay. I have uh, two questions. One is, can you comment about the use of uh, pharmaceutical drugs on children uh, who seem to have no rights regarding the use of drugs? Mm -hmm. And there's a, a new diagnosis, I don't know how new it is, but there's something called ODD, which is Oppositional Defiant Disorder, right. which pretty much describes every teenager that right. people, anyone has ever seen. Uh, so that's one question. The second thing is, can you comment about talking about ODD? Probably everybody at the Red Forum has this disease. Um, <laughs> um, but is there any indication ODD that... <laughs> uh, is there any indication that the government is trying to like, uh, or is thinking about this as, uh, thinking of pharmaceuticals as a way of mass control of people, given the, you know, the rise of the popular uprising of the 99%, the massive, massive demonstrations in Greece, et cetera. And I'm, I'm not, of course, including conspiracy theories like use of, you know, fluoride in the water right. or, or chemtrails where everybody's being dosed, etc. Listen, you can see the medicating and kids to a capitalistic climate. It's basically about market expansion. So you basically say, for example, the SSRI antidepressants, they first are prescribed to adults in the early 1990s. The drug companies were saying the, the adult market was saturated and they began looking for the children's market as an untapped market. And, you know, then they began, and when they tested antidepressants on children, they weren't even effective over the short term, by and large. Didn't matter. They, they kept on prescribing them anyway. So that's one expansion. Why do we get juvenile bipolar disorder, uh, you know, all of a sudden out there? It didn't used to happen. Uh, well, what happened was a man named Joseph Biederman was paid $1.3 million to recategorize oppositional defiant disorder as juvenile bipolar disorder, and by doing so, open up the prescribing of atypical antipsychotics to that group. So I don't think it has, in a sense, any government design of mass control or anything like that. I think it has to do with corporations that expand markets for their products, and children were an untapped market, and they've done it very, very, very successfully. I will say one thing, I don't know if this woman is still here, about the class and all. Um, if you look what's happening to um, your kids in foster care, it's just horrific. Yeah. What's happening in foster care is just a shame beyond belief. Uh, I just did a chapter for a book and it's something like over 50% of foster care kids who are teenagers are on antipsychotics. They're not on antipsychotics because they're psychotic, they're on antipsychotics to sort of curb, you know, quiet them, curb their aggression, that sort of thing. So anyway, to, to my mind, the, the medicating of kids is a story of capitalism run amok. And uh, the kids are not consenting at all. I've talked to many foster care kids who come out of this and they are angry beyond belief and they have a right to be angry. You know, sexual dysfunction, all sorts of problems. Um, I think that there will be a day of reckoning with the, with the medicating of kids and it will be seen as one of the worst moments in our history. I think what's being done to kids is atrocious. Um, I want to thank you so much. Um, and I also want to thank Seth 
Um, I'm a mental, uh, a mental patient, but I have also earned a PhD in the 20 some odd years that I've been in and out of mental institutions. I'm actually an episodic. I was sexually abused at 10 years old by a Catholic priest, and it happened in a church, and he brought me in the back where the priest changed the vestments. He sexually abused me, and I lost my mind for the first time. Periodically, episodically, when I'm under tremendous stress and pressure and anxiety and worry and things go on in my life like anyone else's life, I lose it. I have post-traumatic stress disorder and my truth has been rewritten and I've been lied about in psychiatric records and it happens. And a Washington DC reporter wrote a book called Crazy about his son's experience with so-called mental illness and he reported in his book how he was instructed to lie by the emergency room staff about his son. He had to say that his son was attempting to kill him in order to have the son committed because the commitment laws have, have it that you have to be a danger to yourself or others in order to justify the commitment. I definitely like a lot of the uh, uh, analysis you did on eugenics and you mentioned at least in the response that uh, it's, it's the attitude towards science that's also in play here. Um, you also were talking a bit about uh, how we're waiting for Godot to some degree as for like these tests, but you know I think if we were to speculate a little, I think that uh, at some point in the next couple of years, it's almost inevitable that uh, the same uh, forces that bought Biederman will also buy either a definitive neurochemical, uh, neuroimaging, or genetic proof of of, of disease and disorder, uh, unless there's some uh, advantages to keep it ambiguous to expand the diagnostic net. So the question then is, like, if science is being appropriated in the name of marketing, right? What sorts of strategies and rhetoric do you think uh, can can work against or resist this wielding of fact to short circuit debate? Like, how do we continue to humanize uh, these stories? And you know, what is the most effective uh, strategy for kind of trying to present and convince and persuade with this material? I'm not, I'm not convinced that it's actually these stats are convincing anyone. So you're, you're, you're basically asking how, well, how do we humanize us? How do we get back? How do we persuade and convince? Like, well, it's, it's a question to everybody as far as strategizing. So here's, a, here's his point is that you're saying sort of the system is not going so well, right? And how do we change the system? And, and, and you're sort of saying that in my approach is to look at the statistics and the science, et cetera. But and you're right, the science is being corrupted by marketing, no question yeah. about it, big time. I don't know the answer to that. I think you know we have a lot of capitalistic forces going on in this, in this arena. I will say this. I do think what you were saying in the back, patient voices, the, by patient voices, those so who've been in the system, those voices are really powerful. And they can be a real plea for a more humanistic version of a, ver a vision of human beings together, not apart, discovering our common humanity. Stories are really, really powerful. Uh, maybe they're much more powerful than science. You know, I've sort of taught, tried to talk, I've basically tried an anatomy of an epidemic to say to the powers that be, this is your science. It's not telling the story you're telling us, it's telling us. I, I don't know, I don't know, this is part of a larger story yeah. about how does the American society go forward and become a more humanistic place. No, I don't know. Wrong. Thank you for your work. It's been incredibly powerful and valuable in making these arguments. I'm just trying to challenge for the no. whole thing. You know, beyond I don't know the answer. Facts. I don't know the answer. All right, thanks All right. very much. Yeah. I, I, I got to run. Thanks. I want to say a little thank you. Okay, great. Thanks. Hey, thanks for having me. Yeah, no. You make your hand up. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and, Ma'am, can, can I make an announcement really quickly? Um, we just completed printing a book that takes up a lot of issues around occupying mental health. And I have some draft copies here if anybody wants. Uh, the commitment is to copy edit this edition, and then I can uh, provide you with one on that, on that basis. So.